All right, so tonight we're going to talk about something that kind of intrigued me recently. It's actually a, an experience that uh, I went through, and this is called Your Offense is a Lie. So I'm going to start by saying that the enemy prowls around like a lion to destroy, to offend you. So if you can put up 1 Peter 5.8. So we've all heard this verse before. And I put uh, two different versions because it was kind of interesting how, it, how it's listed. So the first one is the ERV, which is the easy to read version. Control yourselves and be careful. The devil is your enemy. And he goes around like a roaring lion looking for somebody to attack and eat. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And you'll see why, because I kind of look into the characteristics of what a lion does. So the other version, the New King James, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So adversary, in the New King James Version, it was kind of interesting, because if you look it up in the Greek, the word adversary means he's an accuser, one who brings a lawsuit. Or one who brings formal charges against believers as in a courtroom. And I thought that was interesting because a lot of things that happen in the spiritual, they mirror what happened in the natural. So if you go to court, have you ever gone to court or even watched some of those court shows or movies? You know, there's a prosecuting attorney. He, what he does is he brings accusations. And I'll read what a prosecuting attorney does in the natural. The prosecuting attorney is responsible for pre presenting the case against individuals suspected of violating the law. They decide what criminal charges to file, guiding and recommending sentences for offenders. So it's kind of interesting. The, what's the law? So the law for us would be God's law. So in the natural, it's you know the, the natural law. If you break the law, you can have a prosecuting attorney come after you bring charges against you and possibly have you uh, put in jail or worse. So the enemy is an accuser. He has a legal case against you for breaking the law, God's law. So as we know, God went to the cross for us. Uh, when he did, he took the authority back and he set us free. We, we were under his covering. So we want to stay under that covering. But unfortunately, if you break the law, whether it be the natural or the spiritual, there's consequences for that. I don't know if you remember, a, a lot of you who uh, may have read the fire books. So in the fire books, Pastor Kim talks about uh, where he was at the throne of God and he was talking to God and the, he smelled something really bad and he looked over and it was the enemy was there and he was actually accusing believers and asking permission to go after the believers. So I remember that. I don't know if you guys remember that, but I thought it always stuck with me because I thought that was pretty, pretty amazing. So in Job, the book of Job, Job was also accused. So you can pull up Job 1, 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God, angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan the adversary, the accuser, also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Then Satan answered the Lord, from roaming around the earth and from walking around, just like the lion. I thought that was pretty interesting. Number eight, the Lord said to Satan, have you considered and re reflected on my servant Job? For there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man. One who fears God with reverence and abstains from and turns away from evil because he honors God. Then Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge of protection around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and con conferred prosperity and happiness upon him. So you're basically accusing him. He's only, he's only a good servant because of all all the things you've done for him.
Okay, and his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch, destroy all he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. So he's challenging God here and trying to accuse Job. Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that job Job has is in your power. Only, to do, only do not put your hand on the man himself. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. So it was very similar to what happened with Pastor Kim. He was with, at the throne of God. Satan's accusing him. And Satan can do nothing unless he gets permission from God. So your offense could be based on a lie. You know, people tend to get offended. And how does this happen? So a lot of it happens, it comes over very naturally. So a lot of times you can you become the church, you can go to work, things will happen, and all of a sudden you might be asked to do something, maybe by your boss, maybe by the pastors, maybe by um, your authority, and all of a sudden the offense can happen. It's something that you don't want to do, You're, you might be fighting it, uh, you don't agree with it, and that's what offense starts. We've talked about this before. Uh, offense can come as the, the sucker from a tree, is one that kind of grows on its own. So all of a sudden, you have a tree. Um, when the tree is, is cut and it's wounded, it'll start growing an extra little branch on the side. So that, that was called a sucker. Then if it gets worse, not dealt with, it can grow roots like the sycamine tree. We talked about that. So you can pull up Proverbs 18.1. Some people like to do things their own way, and they get upset when people give them advice. So I think that's pretty natural. I mean, even we, we've been here almost nine years, and we came, we didn't have all the answers. We came with our own thoughts, and um, we also got offended. There was things that we were, you know, we had kids, and there was a lot of things we had to learn. So it was something that we had to learn to do, uh, to change, to uh, make the adjustments when uh, God, through the pastors, were trying to help us and guide us and counsel us. And there's times we just don't want to do it. That just, it's pretty common. If you can pull up Luke 17. Jesus warns of offenses. Then he said to, his, to the disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they come. So you're almost guaranteed you're going you're gonna to be offended. And the thing is, you want to try to understand that when the offense comes, it's something that God may be trying to work with us on, something that's not right. He loves us. He wants to change our mind, change our heart. And his word is, is true. So we want to follow his word. And sometimes, as you can see, if you get offended, woe to those who come because there's going to be consequences to that. So my question was, why the lion? Why, did, why does the Bible say he, um, the enemy comes like a roaring lion, like a one whom, uh, who wants to devour you? So I looked up kind of what a lion does. So a roaring lion is one who is hungry and wants to eat. It said that in the scripture. If you look up in the Bible commentary, it says that a roaring lion means it's hungry and is determined to destroy you. So it's very interesting how God uses the lion. So when he's hungry, um, like the enemy, he strategizes. So I wanted to see if you can pull up one of those pictures of the lions. I have a couple of pictures. I had some really cool video, but I'm, I'm going to save that video because it was kind of gory. I don't want to scare you guys. So anyway, so um, the lion, um, the lion, when he's hungry, he's very determined. Um, he camouflages. That's one of, the, one of his characteristics. So he camouflages. You don't see him coming, just like the enemy. He does not come out and say, hey, I'm going to get you. He'll come out, and he'll use something very subtle, something very natural, and he's going to try to catch you. So kind of backing up a little bit, um, also remember the word offense comes from a Greek word. It's it came from a Greek word. It was a little trap. It was a little trap they would put in the old days to catch animals. And they would stumble the animal, and they would, once they caught them, they'd kill them. So that's where the word offense comes from. So if you can pull up the next picture. So 
So on this one, you'll see he's very stealth. Um, the, the lion goes after the slow, weaker animal. And when you see in the actual video, these, these little uh, boars, these little wild boars, they were really tiny. So um, they're pretty, uh, you know, they're pretty smart. They couldn't even, I couldn't imagine how you couldn't see this big old lion, right? But he was there. He, when the, in the video, he's actually getting very close and they're very uh, strategic. So as they got closer and he was crawling in the grass, you can notice that the lion knew that he was too loud with his little pads. So he actually turned his, his arms sideways and he's like almost like on his elbows where he was making almost no noise. So anyways, if you can show the next slide. Yeah, so this one, you'll see how close he was and um, you'll know what happened in the next, if I show the video, that guy didn't stand a chance. So he goes after um, the spiritually weak, just like the enemy goes after the spiritually weak, just like the lion does. That's why God used the lion. So um, they're very patient, very patient animals. So just like the enemy, he will wait. He will wait till the right time comes. You might be asked to do something. You don't like it. Maybe he's, there's some kind of correction you're getting inside your house with your job. Uh, maybe you have to move. And... Um, that's what's going to come over. It's going to come over very natural. So the enemy, this is kind of interesting too. Um, the enemy knows how to find you. Even when it's dark, they don't have this necessarily have night vision. But, you know, they say that uh, these, uh, when you have fear or an anxiety, you let off a pheromone, like a little chemical and I remember uh, my wife and I used to watch these shows, these, uh, you know, these cop shows where uh, they actually did a test of these, uh, these uh, police dogs, and they're very smart. They, they set up this big yard, like a big um, field in a yard, and they put those outhouses, those stinky outhouses, those plastic ones you see on the, at a job site. So they put like 500 of them, and they put a guy who, um, who was... Uh, you know, he was kind of playing that he was like uh, the robber. So he went and hid in one of those. And there's 500 of them. And uh, the dog can smell the guy. He can smell his fear. He can smell the pheromone coming from his body. And that's what happens with the animals. So that's what the, en that's what the enemy does. When you're in fear and anxiety and you're not trusting God, the enemy can sense that and he'll come after you. So anyways, in that show, the dog found the guy. Like, right away. So it was kind of interesting. So the enemy will come after you like this lion, little by little. He doesn't just jump out of the bush. He's, he's very strategic. But see, at the same time, God wants us to be strategic, right? Just because the enemy does that, God's much smarter than he is. So how are we strategic in this? We have to stay in the word. We got to pray. Because if not, when you least expect it and you stay weaker, like when you're not praying and reading, you're kind of the weaker, you're the weaker animal, and the enemy knows how to come after you. So it's almost like working out, of those of you who exercise. So you have to stay in the natural, you have to stay in shape, right? If something comes to you, if you fall down, you, you, uh, you fall down, you're playing a sport or something, and you're in pretty good shape, you eat well, um, something happens, you might get a little scrape, you might get a little bump, but you're going to be fine. But the ones who don't um, exercise or take care of their body or eat well, they're going to get sick, you're going to get hurt, and, um, you know, physically you're going to be weaker and you can get sick or die. And the same thing in the spiritual, you have to stay in the Word. So what should we do? This is a question. There's always like a problem, right? So the problem is you don't want to be the one offended because the, off the offense, you're going to have the enemy come after you. He'll know how to find you. You're going to be the one that's kind of off to the side. Um, you're going to have a wall up, and you're going to have fear. You're not going to be trusting God. So what we need to do is we need to repent. So we got to repent, apologize, and believe 
believe God. And because what happens is the enemy, he wants you to believe his lie. Like he, like he was trying to do with Job. He, he wants you to, to believe the lie. And that's the title of the sermon. It's, it's really based on a lie. The lie says that we're not good enough. It says that we should be somewhere else when we're not. So a lot of times God will have you in a season doing a certain job, doing, um, you know, maybe in a certain time of your life doing something. And, and if you're not trusting God, you're going to want to be somewhere else where the grass is greener. So the enemy will lie to you thinking you should be doing more and you're going to start pushing, trying to get ahead of God and get yourself in trouble. So he wants to keep you off track with God. So understanding that whole, this whole thing is spiritual warfare. So being that a spiritual warfare, you want to stay spiritually and physically in shape, right? So the thing is we want to shut the door on these lies, stop reopening the door. And a lot of times, you know, we'll come here, we'll hear the word, we read on band, we're praying, uh, we know the truth, but a lot of times that a little offense will come, and instead of shutting the door on that, you leave the door open. The pastor talks this, about this all the time. You leave a crack in the wall, and the enemy, just like that lion, he knows. Now he can smell that, and he's going to start coming after you because you're actually allowing him back in. Remember, God, when he went to the cross for us, he gave us the authority. The authority is now with him, but every time you go back, you might get discouraged, you're going to go back, and you're going to let the enemy right back in. So we need to stop. We need to stop feeding the enemy because, as the scripture says, he, and the uh, lion comes to eat, and we don't. We want to. We want to starve him out. A lot of times, in, uh, when we were at the uh, at the old church on Osgood, um, Pastor used to talk about um, you have to kill the bear, and we used to kind of laugh about it because a lot of times something will happen. Maybe a fence will come, and you get started, or maybe you get cut off on the road, and you start feeling your blood rising. You're going to start getting mad. But he says right when that comes, that's when your opportunity comes to kill the bear. You have to kill it. It comes out of the cave. And if you don't kill it, he's going to go right back in. He's going to come back later looking for more food. So we want to starve him out. If you can put up James 4. So let God's work, so let God work his will in you. Yell a loud no to the devil and watch him make himself scarce. Say a quiet yes to God and he'll be there in no time. Quit dabbling in sin. Purify your inner life. Quit playing the field. Hit bottom and cry your eyes out. The fun and games are over. Get serious, really serious. Get down on your knees before the master it's the only way you'll get on your feet. So if you're getting offended, you're, you know, the bottom line is we have to trust God. We have to be willing to go to him, humble ourselves, repent. And if you can pull up the other side, there was another side, yeah. So the other one says to submit to the authority of God. Resist the devil, stand firm against him, and he will flee from you. So that's the answer. So when that little, you know, when you want to kill the bear and you feel that offense coming, you'll want to, when you start feeling that, you just go to God. You can, even if you made a mistake, you're in sin, it doesn't matter. God, he's going to love us no matter what. So you give it up to him, you quit dabbling in sin, and you purify yourself. And the Bible says the ones who see God are the ones who purify themselves. They have clean hands, clean heart, and that's how we see God. We're going to be more like him. Amen? So unfortunately, when we tend, when we tend to get offended um, with God, a lot of times we can start going back to our own vices. And this has actually happened with me too. So you'll be kind of like doing your thing and then all of a sudden you get a correction or something happens and you start feeling like, you know, you don't like the instruction or uh, maybe you got caught in sin. Maybe you had a, a, we had a, a meeting with the pastor. Something may have gone wrong. So 
a lot of times when you start feeling, um, you might start feeling guilty, you might start feeling embarrassed. And a lot of times, instead of using that moment to kill the bear, you're going to kind of take, take a step back and you're going to start going back into, oops, you're going to start going back into your own vices. For example, if your vices was, you used to be a drinker, all of a sudden, you might go back to drinking again. If uh, you're on a fast or a diet, you've been working with uh, maybe the pastors or your holy dance team, all of a sudden, you'll go cheat on the diet. So that's what people do. You know, we, we all can do this. You know, it's very, it's a fine line. So when you feel that, you have to kill it. You, how do you kill it? You get it back into prayer. You go back into reading the word. You get back into talking to God. If you're feeling, if you were one that was always insecure, uh, you might start getting jealous. And if you start getting jealous because somebody's getting something you're not, um, that can turn into hate. So we have to be careful with that. Pastor, we talked about this the other day too, but when you're given instruction, if you're offended, you're going to do things with a half a heart. All of a sudden now, instead of um, maybe you have to clean the bathroom, maybe you're just like doing a quick job on it or maybe you don't want to do it anymore or, you know, even if like, you know, a lot of us have responsibilities here, uh, whether it be the holy dance teams, uh, cleaning, um, anything, if you're going to be offended, if you allow that offense to come in, you're going to... You may not go back to, say, drinking, but you're going to go all of a sudden, you're going to do things with the half heart. So, Psalms 55. Question is, who gets offended? Who's the one that's offended here? It is not an enemy who taunts me. I could bear that. It is not my foes who so arrogantly insult me. I could have hidden from them. Instead, it is you my equal, my companion, and close friend. What good fellowship we once enjoyed as we walked together to the house of God. God's saying that it's us. It's the believers. It's not people outside. It's the people with the fellowship walking together in the house of God. So that's, that's scary. We have the answers here, but yet we can easily be offended here. If you can pull up Matthew 26. If you guys ever have a chance, um, in, on YouTube, um, Pastor used to have a bunch of old, um, uh, from the old church, he had a lot of old sermons, and he has a lot of really good ones. He, he always had great revelation, and he talked about Judas, and I was just kind of led to Judas because uh, my wife and I got into a conversation a while back about we, Judas was offended, right? So what happened with Judas? So in Matthew 26, as they were eating... Jesus said, I tell you the truth, one of you will turn against and betray me. So what's happening is they're sitting there, and Jesus is actually warning Judas because Judas was offended. Why? Um, earlier, um, when, the, um, when they broke the alabaster jar, and he said that we should give it to the poor, so on the surface, it looks like Judas, wow, what a great guy. But in reality, um, Judas was the treasurer. He was the one in charge of the money. So he was a thief. He was a thief. He was taking the money, and um, Judas was greedy. And uh, when, in that sermon that Pastor talked about, um, it, was just, it was just really interesting because there was a lot of things going on with Judas. I'll, I'll just go on. This made the followers' disciples very sad. These guys were just, they were kind of pure. They were like, hey, I don't want it to be me. They were distressed. Each one began to say to Jesus, Surely, Lord, I am not the one, am I? Surely not I, Lord, or is it I, Lord? They're kind of asking, right? So Jesus answered, The man who has dipped his hand with me into the bowl, probably not a signal, but means one who shares close fellowship with me. Just like that other verse we talked about, it's the one who has the close fellowship or the ones who are offended is the one who will turn against me and betray me. So he gives them another, he gives them a second warning here because Judas, they say like when you um, were sitting at the table and you dipped in the bowl, it was like a, like a, you had, it was like an honor. You got to do that. So the Lord, you know, he's not over there accusing him. He already knows he's going to betray him. So instead of saying that, he's given him another chance. He lets him have place of honor. He gives him this massive grace, right? And he decides, uh, 
Judas decides that instead of coming and say, hey, Lord, it was me, I'm sorry, I'm the one, he had a chance right there. He decided that, he said, he basically said it was not him, and that's when Satan entered him, and then it was too late. So, people will hide instead of turn. So I put that because you have an opportunity. There's always that tipping point where you can get, have a chance, like we talked about killing the bear, or you can either go hide or you can, or you can turn and get back on track with God. God always gives us chances. He's very gracious to all of us. We've all been down that road. So when Judas, getting back to Judas, when he ended up taking that bread and eating that bread, he was basically believing the lie. He was believing the lie that uh, when he was offended, he was believing the lie that when he took, partook that bread, he basically was, was um, accepting that, that lie instead of trusting the Lord who was right there. And that's when Satan came and entered inside him. So he partook in the lie. Judas was offended. Basically, he wanted, to, he wanted to destroy the Romans. He was a thief. And he wanted what he wanted. So I remember Pastor, when he was talking about this, I don't know how I remember this. My wife's the one with a good memory. But um, Pastor said that uh, Judas had three characteristics. He was faithless. He was an overthinker. And he was greedy. And for me, just to remember things, I always put it like in an acronym. So faithless overthinker, greedy is fog, right? F-O-G. So what happens when you are on the wrong track, you get offended, uh, you're faithless, um, he was greedy, it puts you in a fog. And when you're in a fog, you're going to be deceived and you're not going to be able to move forward. I was thinking about this um, Years back, um, my wife's family lived in uh, Fresno. And uh, have you ever gone to Fresno? It's like way out there, just like a bunch of flat lands. And, and uh, we went there for Christmas one time, and the fog was so bad. We used, I used to hear about it. But uh, when we were driving on the way back, it was dark, and it was kind of cold, but the fog was so thick. You literally could not see from here to that, to that piano. It was dangerous. I was kind of scared. I was like driving really slow. And my wife was all like, yeah, it's just go. It's good. But, but basically, we couldn't go forward. We couldn't really move because the fog was so thick. So it just kind of reminded me of like when you're in a fog, you just, you're not going to be able to move forward. Same thing like when you get something in your eye, right? Um, I was working outside the other day, and I shook this blanket, and this little something flew in my eye, and I just could not see. So I... I was thinking about it. I was trying to like wash my eye out and, and trying to figure this thing out and get this thing out. And when you're doing that, right in that moment, all you're thinking about is your eye, in your eye and getting this thing out. So I could not see. I'm, it's blurry. I'm trying to find my way to the sink. Anyways, I finally got it out. But So it's like an offense. Once the offense is there, you can see nothing else. All you can think about is the offense. And the only way you're going to get that, that offense out is you... You basically have to cleanse it out. So that's kind of what I did in the natural. But in the, in the uh, spiritual, you have to clear, cleanse out a fence. And then you'll be able to move forward, get back on track with God. Amen? So if you can pull up 2 Corinthians 10. So a fence builds up walls, strongholds. And this is kind of an interesting verse. If you're ever like not sure on some of these verses, you can pull it up in a commentary, and it'll go into detail like what it really meant. So um, this one says, although we live in the world, walk in the flesh, we do not fight wage, fight wage war in the same way the world fights, according to the flesh. We've all heard this scripture before. We fight with weapons that are different from those world, from the world uses, not merely human weapons, not of the flesh, or weapons have power from God that can destroy the enemy strong places strongholds strongholds and fortresses when somebody gets offended 
you put up a wall. You put up a fortress. So the stronghold is wrong thinking. So that's where this is coming from. So if you're offended and you don't deal with it and you let it go, you start putting up the wall, you start isolating, and that's where the enemy wants you. That's where that lion wants you because he knows you're the weaker one and he's going to destroy you. We destroy people's arguments, human reasoning, sophistries, and every proud thing, pretension, exalted opinion, high thing that raises itself against the knowledge of God. That's wrong thinking. That's wrong thinking, um, offenses. And, you know, a lot of times um, I, I remember hearing that word, uh, scapegoat. And, you know, people used that way back in the day, in the Bible days. So when they had a scapegoat, they would put a goat, like all the sins of the people would put it on this goat, and they would send him off into the wilderness. And the end of the wilderness, he would go out there and he'd get killed by what else? Like a lion. So they would do that. But the word scapegoat really means a warped sense of thinking. It's the same thing. If you're, if you're offended and you don't deal with it and you have the wrong, um, you have the wrong ideas and you have these walls up, all of a sudden you're going to have, you're, and you're not following the knowledge of God, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be deceived. So we capture every thought and make it obey Christ. That's what we want to do. We want everything we're thinking to obey God. Earlier I was talking about uh, something personally happened with us. So back in January, um, we, uh, my wife and I, we had a talk with our daughter, Sarah, and um, Sarah was going through, uh, she was kind of going through some things, uh, we weren't too sure, and we actually sat her down, and I sat her down, and I actually talked to her, I just corrected her, and um, she didn't like it, I could tell, I could tell she was kind of taken aback by it, but that was back in January of this year, so anyway, she, um, she started getting really quiet. Uh, I knew right away, because the way Sarah is, she's very, you know, she can be kind of, uh, you know, kind of bubbly and joking around. But all of a sudden, the wall came up, and I was asking my wife, um, I don't think she liked that. I think we need to talk to her. So we did talk to her. We sat her down. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, I'm good. Um, there's nothing wrong. I can handle this. It's all good. But, you know, and then she started, like, getting into this thought process of, well, because, you know, I'm an adult now, maybe uh, we shouldn't be so close anyway. And um, see, all of a sudden, hers the wrong thoughts. Hers the warped sense of thinking. So she starts going through this, and here we go into February. Then we're going into March. And um, long story short, um, we got to a point where we talked to the pastors, and we just sat her down, and my, my wife just said, you know what, you just need to, you need to apologize. You need to apologize and repent. And that's exactly what she did. And it was almost the very next day she turned. So it was pretty amazing because even though it was uh, something that Sarah went through, we all can go through something like this. We all can have something very simple pull us off track. And all of a sudden, it might hurt our pride. We don't feel good about it. And all of a sudden, you know, we're isolating ourselves and we're getting off track. So anyways... Um, we recently went out of town to go uh, visit my wife's family, and Sarah came with us, and it was just a great time. She was back to normal, and we are just praising God for that. So my question is, when pastors or any of your authority, even your boss, gives you an instruction, how do you respond? Do you, uh, do you accept it right away, or do you hide um, like Adam and Eve did in the garden when they sinned and they hid from the Lord and covered themselves. So there is a remedy to all this. Yes, it's repent and, and apologize to God. But the remedy is also we also need a strategy. So just like the enemy has a strategy, God's way better in his strategies. So if you can pull up Proverbs 24. So we need strategies to defeat the enemy. It's better to be wise than strong. Intelligence outranks muscle any day. Strategic planning is the key to warfare. To win, you need a lot of good counsel. So that's, that's a good answer. It's a good remedy for us. Our counsel is through the pastors. Our counsel is through going to God, through praying, reading, worshiping.
But the main thing is if you ever have a question, you ever have a problem, go to the pastors, receive it, go to your authority. And as you can see here, it's spiritual warfare. So you're going to have to do something that's going to fight off the enemy. He's pretty, we hear he's pretty smart, but God's way smarter than him. Um, Isaiah 9, 6. This is the only version in the Bible. And if you can just pull up verse 6. For a child has been born to us, a son has been given to us. He shoulders responsibility and is called extraordinary strategist. And when you look, when you look that up, God is, he's brilliant. His ways are way beyond our ways. So if you want your, your problems solved, your, your questions answered, we need to go to God. He's the extraordinary strategist. He's the one that's going to get us through. Amen? So we need good counsel from our leadership. We need to obey, um, get into words, stay in prayer. And it's just like I was talking about earlier. It's like in the natural, you're going to have to get your rest, eat well, exercise, and you'll stay physically strong. You can endure. Same thing in the spiritual. You have to stay in the word. You have to read, pray, get the counsel, and then you'll be able to endure spiritually. So we want to make sure we do that because if we don't do that and we start getting offended, it's going to block the flow of the Holy Spirit, and that's the last thing that we want because that means we're going nowhere. So we want to be able to flow with God, flow with the pastors, our bosses, anybody in authority, even your spouse. You know, your spouse could be doing the right thing, and if you get offended, something that you didn't like, you're not going to flow with them. So just remember, if you're, if you're in a point where you, you feel that uh, you might feel an offense coming, something's, something bothers you, it's, just remember that roaring lion. He can smell that. He can smell that pheromone coming from you. He, he knows that you have this, uh, you know, now you're becoming weak, you're becoming slow, and that's when the enemy comes after you. You actually open that door for him to find you. So you want to make sure you cut that off. You do that by staying in obedience, staying in the word, like I talked about. And then uh, the last verse, Psalm 119. I really love this verse. Great peace have they which love thy law, which is God's word, and nothing shall offend them. So you stay in the word, nothing could offend you. You're, you just stay close to God, and he's, he's got you. He's got your back. Only then you're going to overcome any offenses, defeat the enemy, and like this says, you're going to have God's peace. Amen?